Okay, hopefully you've, you don't have to have done it yet, but you need to watch those two videos that I sent last week. You don't have to. Um, going over all the literary terms because I do include in those two um, sessions a couple of poems that aren't on the syllabus, but they are on quizzes and the exam, and I make it clear, you know, this may show up. For example, one of them I think is on this syllabus, Dog's Death, Those Winter Sundays by Hayden, and um, Death of the Ball Turret Gunner. I thought that was on the syllabus. I might have removed it. <clears throat> Those could show up on the first couple of quizzes, could show up on the final exam. So today, since we didn't meet Monday, and I'd hoped we'd be able to meet and talk about at least these two poems after finishing Hamlet, um, two poems to start for today, one by Robert Herrick, bottom of page 645 in the 11th edition, page 812 in the 10th edition, and then Two is Coy Mistress by Andrew Marvell, um, on the next page. They're both carpe diem poems. Seize the day. What, what's implied there with this idea? <clears throat> Why? Because you're, you have one chance, you have one last time. And keep going, you're 90% there. What could happen? Pingo. You might die tomorrow. You might die in your sleep tonight. Morbid thought, but you know, the readiness is all, as Hamlet says. So, Robert Herrick, to the virgins to make much of time, just very briefly, Herrick was an Anglican priest. Uh, west of England, he didn't like where he was a priest. He wanted to be in London, because London's where life was and everything. This is page 645 in the 11th edition, 812 in the 10th edition. Um, he wrote <coughs> a wide variety of poetry. He wrote about drinking. He wrote about sex. He wrote about God. He wrote about religious themes. Covered the whole gamut of human experience. Okay. <coughs> Sorry, these allergies are killing me. <coughs> Gather ye rosebuds while ye may, old time is still a flying. And this same flower that smiles today, tomorrow will be dying. There's, there's the theme right there. The flower <coughs> that blooms today, tomorrow will be what? Dying. Okay? So, old time is still a flying. That was a Renaissance, 17th century, even earlier idea that the earth was old and dying and time was running out. The glorious lamp of heaven, <coughs> good grief, I haven't started coffee until literally just now. The glorious lamp of heaven, the sun, the higher he's a getting, the sooner will his race be run, and nearer he's to setting. <coughs> sun rises, what happens when it hits the PM, the prime meridian? We think of it as like this. It's a nice, gentle, no. <laughs> what really happens when it hits here, it starts to climb. His point is, this is when. This is whenever we die. We think, you know, our life is like birth and maybe 80. That prime meridian, it's not 45, or it's not 40, it's not 35. It's when the car is coming right at you and hits you kind of a thing, okay? So, glorious lamp of heaven, the sun, the higher he's a getting, the sooner will his race be run. He means once it hits here, the, the race is essentially over. You guys are, you guys are back here still. See, I'm, I'm just a dead man walking, metaphorically speaking. I'm way past this point. Because there's no way in God's green earth I'm going to live to be 122 or 3, whatever. <clears throat> so, the higher he's a getting, the sooner will his race be run and nearer he's to setting. 
that age is best which is the first when youth and blood are warmer. The prime of one's life, when one is young. But being spent, the worse in worst times still succeed the former. Being spent, when your youth is spent, what's tomorrow like? Worse than today. What's the day after tomorrow like? Worse than tomorrow. In other words, every day is progressively, metaphorically, worse. Why? Just think basic physiology. Your body's breaking down. It's not regenerating like it used to, etc. Okay? We know that today. They didn't know the scientific reasons necessarily. Also, when youth and blood are warmer, there was a notion during the Renaissance, 17th century, eight, uh, mid, Middle Ages to some extent, that when you're young, your blood is like the water in this cup. It's very fluid, okay? As you age, use a different image, as you age, or I can, I can still use this image, when you're young, your blood is like bacon grease right after that bacon has been fried. You could take that pan and do this, and that grease will slosh all over. You set that pan down and let it sit for a couple hours, and you could turn it upside down, and it's not going to move. That's what happens to your blood as you get older, okay, is the image that's used. So being spent, if that youth is spent, the worst in worst times still succeed the former then be not coy, but use your time. And while you may, go marry. Now the marry, M-A-R-R-Y, if the poem is merely being read aloud or heard, it's being, you know, recited, go marry can mean what? Go M-E-R-R-Y, okay? For having lost but once your prime, you may forever tarry. Who's the intended audience? What's the title? Virgin. To the virgins to make much of time. Virgin, male or female? Anything in the poem indicate? Are there any feminine pronouns? Nope. Any masculine pronouns? Nope. It can be to either sex, okay? There's one word, however, that loads it to being aimed at women. Anybody know what that one word is? It's one word that is not usually used in connection with men. It's used primarily in connection with women. Koi. Anybody know what coy means? It can be shy. Take the idea of shyness a little bit farther. Say in a male-female relationship, the beginnings of an affair, so to speak, or a love relationship. Coy can be what? Okay, shy. Keep going. Louder? Reserved. Reserved. Yeah, add a little negative or dark kind of tinge to it. Shy or reserved for what purpose? I'm getting at intent. Hard to get. Playing a game. Everybody, whether you admit it or not, Everybody knows, everybody acknowledges for the last thousand years, okay, that there is a certain kind of dance that is involved, I'm going to use, you know, traditional categories, between men and women in the courting process, okay? The man advances, the woman receives, so to speak. And sometimes, <coughs> especially in literature, the woman does what? The, the tables almost get reversed a little bit. 
because another metaphor is used to describe this relationship. Fishing. Okay? This was used a lot to describe Queen Elizabeth. The first one, not the second one. That she would throw her bait out, the bait being me, <laughs> Queen of England, virgin, available, in real and prospective suitors. Philip II of Spain, for example, being one. She kind of kept a few men on the edge, so to speak. She'd reel them in a little bit and then let them back out. That's being coy, okay? Now, understanding that, go back to that last stanza. <coughs> then be not coy, but use your time, and while ye may, go marry, and think of the marry, get wed, meaning of M-A-R-R-Y, why? The why comes in the last two lines. You better get married while you're young, while you're in your prime, because once you lose that prime, and what is the prime? It's the first age. What else is it? What are you generally, more so when you're younger than when you are older? Men or women. Better looking, more handsome, more beautiful, etc. Why? Because when you get old, your hair turns gray, your body starts to sag in various places. That's it. You're no longer as attractive. You're no longer as appealing. You're no longer as desirable. And if you lose that prime, that youth, what? You may forever tarry. What does tarry mean? Wait for what? Wait for your Prince Charming. Wait for your whatever. Once you're old, don't mean to be so cruel, once you're old and ugly, you're going to be old and ugly. Nobody's going to want you then. So use it when you have it, or use it or lose it. Okay? Carpe diem. Second one. Now I'm going to warn you right now. This one has a thoroughly disgusting image. I mean, it's raunchy disgusting, okay? Part of it has to be explained, and I will explain it. I think this textbook, yeah, does it. Another one of my textbooks, different class, an upper division English course, actually has over about the last five or six years started to gloss this term, and I don't know if it's, I'm the only one that I know of that has pointed out the meaning of this word. I mean, literally. I've never seen it discussed in scholarly articles, etc. I started doing it in class, I don't know, about 15 years ago. And about five, maybe 10 years ago, it started being glossed this way. I'm not taking credit for it, I'm just saying, you know, it's kind of interesting. So, Andrew Marvell to his coy mistress. Um, Marvell was a kind of a government bureaucrat, served as secretary to famous people. Secretary means he wrote letters for them. He handled their correspondence, that kind of stuff. John Milton being one of them, okay? This poem is in three long sections. Not, you can't really call them stanzas, per se. <laughs> the first one indicates a condition contrary to fact. In other words, the poem begins with a subjunctive. Okay. Had we but world enough and time, that's the subjunctive. Why? Because we don't have world enough and time. None of us has all the time in the world. We might think we do. Those nine-year-olds in Nashville two weeks ago, they thought they had all the time in the world left. Okay. And probably those 16, 61-year-olds thought they had an awful lot of time left. Had we but world enough in time, this, and there's the word, this coyness, lady, were no crime. So the flip side of that, since we don't have world enough in time, what is the speaker saying? Her coyness, lady, her, 
What? It is a crime. She's, she's done some kind of criminal act against the speaker. What's the criminal act? We're going to find out. Okay? So, we would sit down and think which way to walk and pass our long loves day. Our long loves. That is, if we had all the time in the world, we could spend all the time in the world doing what? What do you want to do? I don't know. What do you want to do? <laughs> Thou by the... And so he starts to give images. Thou by the Indian Ganges side shouldst rubies find. I by the tide of Umber would complain. Umber is a river in northern England. Complain, he doesn't mean moan and whine and bitch. He means write love songs. So you could sit over in the Indies, India, and look for rubies till the end of time, and I would sit here and write my plaintive little love songs about how much I love you and can't have you because you're in India. Cool? I would love you 10 years before the flood, and you should, if you please, refuse till the conversion of the Jews. 10 years before what flood? Why is flood capitalized? Noah's flood, which is like, what, Genesis 6, 7, 8, something like that. Way the heck back there in time. And she should refuse him. So he says, I would do what? I would love you 10 years before the flood began, and you would refuse me till when? The conversion of the Jews. Protestant theology, that's when? The end of time. Okay, so 10 years before the flood to the beginning of eternity, essentially, judgment day. That's a long period of time. My vegetable love should grow vaster than empires. And all that's meant by vegetable, slow growing. Plant a watermelon seed, plant a pumpkin seed, and watch it grow. Pumpkins take about 120 days. It's three months, four months. Okay. Radishes and lettuce, they take about a month and a half. So plant it and watch it grow slowly. Faster than empires and more slow. Ah, and we finally get some, some actual dates or terms. So, a hundred years, he says what? A hundred years should go to praise thine eyes. I'm assuming that's 100 for both eyes. He's not going to 50 for the left, 100 for the left, 100 for the right. Okay? 100 years should go to praise thine eyes, and on thy forehead, gaze. She's going to sit there for 100 years and just praise her forehead and her eyes. Fine. 200 to adore each breast. Assuming she's not deformed in any way, two breasts, 400 years. But 30,000 to the rest. What's he mean by the rest? Notice where the speaker begins top and head south. Okay? To her waist, in other words, telling us what he values the most. What's the poem about? Is it about her beauty? No, it's about, I see a couple of women shaking their heads because they're disgusted. What's it? It's about sex, period. Okay? An age at least to every part in the last, oh, isn't that sweet? The last age should show your heart. For lady, you deserve this state. Nor would I love at lower, and then he introduces this other idea, rate. What's that mean? Rate. You know, you're worth at least a thousand bucks. I mean, okay, maybe ten thousand. You know, there's an old joke. You know, how much would it cost for you to sleep with me? A million, two million. I'll do it for five million. Okay, so let's start negotiating. Because now that I know that you're a prostitute, I just you know get get the price I want. That's, that's kind of the language. By using rate, what is that? It 
It's a market. That's a financial term. Your love is worth X, Y, Z. Okay. Successful? Come on, you know. Is this going to work at a bar? Probably not. Why? It's not meant seriously. This isn't a serious love poem. Okay. So, that's the end of the first section that begins that subjunctive. Second part begins. So, had we but world enough in time, but at my back I always hear time's winged chariot <laughs> hurrying near. Notice what time is doing. It's chasing the speaker. Right? It is for every one of us, whether you think about it or not. That's Hamlet's whole point in that the readiness is all speech. Time. How is time portrayed? On a chariot. What is time? Let me rephrase. What is death? often portrayed as, like in film or something like that. The Grim Reaper, the guy dressed in all in black, and what does he have? A scythe. Why? Because while you're running away from time, time sneaks up behind you, takes your legs out from under you. When that happens, you're dead. Notice, you don't face it. <laughs> you don't look death in the face, so to speak. We're going to have poets who do talk about looking death in the face, but not here. But at my back, I always hear time's winged chariot hurrying near. And yonder, all before us, so now it's the speaker and the beloved, the woman, running forward, racing away from time. All before us lie deserts of vast eternity. Lie eternity is supposed to rise. Okay. Really? Do you think of eternity as being a desert? When I used to drive back and forth when I went to school, college on Lookout Mountain, Tennessee, and I drive back and forth from what's now called Silicon Valley to Chattanooga, I'd go through the Mojave Desert, Death Valley, and Arizona, and New Mexico, and the Panhandle of Texas. It's all desert. I mean, it's just blah. Okay. I really know what vast deserts imply. I mean, there's a point where you get in California. At Barstow, it says, fill up now. Make sure you have a full tank of gas and water if it's during the summer. Because if your car breaks down, you're like 100 miles from the nearest gas station. In Death Valley, you know, 120, 130 degrees is not uncommon. And cars bake. <laughs> Tires melt if they sit too long on the highway. Literally, they melt. Okay? Popular conception, eternity, meaning death in the great beyond, not hell, is often described how? It's more garden-like. It's more paradisal. Not the Sahara Desert, and you're plopped out in the middle. Okay? So time's coming, in the future is a desert. Thy beauty shall no more be found, nor in thy marble vault shall sound my echoing song. In those deserts of vast eternity, you're not going to be what anymore? Beautiful. Nor am I going to what? Sing my echoing song. The song, like the plaintive, the complaints that he talked about earlier? No. What's going to happen in the future? Okay, what's the future the speaker's talking about? First of all, death. Death's going to catch us. That's why there's a marble vault. It's the vault where her bones are. Here's the disgusting image. Be prepared. Then, in the future, when we're both dead, worms shall try that long-preserved virginity. And turn your quaint honor to dust and into ashes all my lust. Try means attempt, prove her virginity. Worms are going to go in and out of what you didn't let me go in and out of. Pretty disgusting, right? And it almost makes it more explicit. 
in your quaint honor turned to dust. <coughs> we don't use the word quaint very often anymore. It used to be used a lot. Okay? Now, it has connotations of fine or fastidious, sometimes, you know, scrupulous, okay? So if someone doesn't have scruples, it means they're not scrupulous. Scrupulous means paying attention to the little details and things like that. Popular meanings for it, all right? It comes from the Middle English, quinta, which can mean that. It can be, you know, fine or nice as in detailed, all right? Look at the sounds, and that will give you some indication of what this word is in modern English, because it's not quaint. It's Middle English is cunning. You have in Chaucer's Canterbury Tales a character who's called Handy Nicholas, means handsy. His name is actually Hinda which can be translated gentle. It can also be translated, he's good with his hands. And he's always going around in this one story, grabbing his girlfriend by the quinta. Okay. It can't be in any of these, because you can't grab a scrupulous. You can't grab a fastidious. You can't grab a fine. You can't, OK? This becomes this, which in slang modern English is spelled with the C, that, okay? That never used to be lost until about five, 10 years ago. And notice, it's not lost here because this editor is not going to touch that, especially, what year is it? In 2023. It's hard to believe it's 2023. So, in your long preserved virginity and your quaint honor turned to dust and into ashes all my lust. The grave's a fine and private place, but none I think do there embrace. Once you're dead, there's no hugging. Now, that is possibly also an allusion to a poem by John Donne called The Relic, about a grave being dug up, okay? Like in Hamlet, you know, the grave being dug up to put new bodies into the grave. And the people discover a piece of bone, a wrist bone, and a locket of hair around the bone, okay? And the poem is titled The Relic because this relic is of two lovers and how they are entwined eternally because of the locket of hair wrapped around the male, the woman's locket of hair wrapped around the male's wrist, like even in death we're united, okay? Now, therefore, so, had we but worldly enough of time, we don't. Now, therefore, and the poet moves to the present. Here's the carpe diem. While the youthful hue sits on thy skin like morning dew. Youthful hue, youthful appearance. Okay, who's it addressed to? A woman. What's that youthful hue? That smooth, perfect complexion, essentially. Okay? While it sits on your skin like what? Morning dew. Like if you drove in earlier this morning, in fact, even outside now, I can still see the glistening of a little bit of it. The grass is covered with dew. What happens to that moisture on the grass? It evaporates. It disappears in what? The sun. Have you ever seen some people, men and women, by the way, who've just you know, worshipped the sun a little bit too much? I knew a, a woman, she operated the switchboard in, in college. I'm not kidding. She looked like walking leather. Her, it just, it was, she was pretty, but her skin was like mummified because she would go out and spend all weekend just, you know, worshipping the sun. Not this. <laughs> okay, so that youthful hue is going to do what? 
Like morning dew, it's going to disappear. And while thy, ooh, here's something new. Thy willing soul transpires at every pore with instant fires. What's the speaker saying about the person he's addressing? Your willing soul. What's he saying to her? This might be, for some of you, as disgusting as the earlier disgusting image, because he's assuming something. You want me. I know you want me. Your soul wills, it desires me. Your willing soul does what? Transpires, it breathes forth at every pore with instant fires. She's hot for him. Okay? Okay? Now let us sport us while we may. Let's have fun. And now, what? Like amorous birds of prey? Rather at once our time devour than languish in his slow chapter power. Right? What the hell is he talking about? Amorous birds of prey. What are birds of prey? Give me an example of one. An eagle. A falcon. Uh, hawk, etc. There was a belief in the Renaissance in 17th century that birds of prey would meet in this fashion. They'd fly up like a mile in the air. Okay? The male would mount the female and they would stop flying. So if they stop flying and they're 6,000 feet in the air, what are they doing? They're falling. And she's going, hurry. Hurry, 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 hurry. What's the speaker getting at? What do they do with their time? They use it quickly. Notice, rather than languish in time's slow chapped power, slow jawed, that doesn't help. Slow chap means slow chewing. Because what does time do? It slowly wears things away. At one point in geological history of the North American continent, the Smokies probably look like the Rockies. They don't anymore. The Rockies are generally pointy-topped. The Smokies are hills. They're rounded, generally. Time has slowly chewed them away, okay? So let's be like these birds of prey rather than these mountains. Let us roll all our strength and all our sweetness up into one ball. That is, let's get so intertwined to do what? To make one out of two and tear our pleasures with rough strife through the iron gates of life. I once had a student talk about how the point... I'm not kidding. How the poem was advocating bondage and sadomasochism and stuff like that. It's not what is meant by rough strife. Okay? It just means getting busy. Get, let's get moving quickly. Okay? Thus, though we cannot make our sun stand still, biblical illusion, Joshua before the battle of the city of Ai, okay, in the book of Joshua, um, prayed and God made the sun stand still for a day so that they could wipe out the inhabitants of I. We, the speaker, we can't do that. <laughs> we can't make our sun stand still. But what will we do? Oh, we're going to give the sun a run for its money. In other words, we're going to do what with our time? We are going to eat up time through sex rather than time slowly devouring us. Seize the day, right? I mean, speakers say, we got 24 hours. Let's get busy. Not meant seriously. This is an intellectual exercise. As many Carpe Diem poems are, they're designed to see how witty can I be? How, what kind of mental gymnastics can I do? And we're going to read a poem, a poet, uh, if we get to it today, 
by John Dunn, where he's going to do all these mental gymnastics. And he's going to expect us to follow on along and to see the kinds of uh, comparisons that he's making. Okay? Go from there to the author to her book, page 692. Oh, just one, one um, hold on there for a moment. Go to page 690. I love this poem. I never assigned it, but I always do this because it's very short. And it just, the image is startling. Margaret Atwood. Uh, Handmaid's Tale. You fit into me. You fit into me like a hook into an eye. Don't read the second two lines. Just that. You fit into me like a hook into an eye. Men don't have this issue. Because we don't have clothing, generally, that has a hook and an eye. Many women do. What's the hook and eye? Where are they? Skirt or dress, right? Or bra, the snap at the back. You've got a hook that fits into a loop. That's what that sounds like. Then you get the next two lines. In other words, that's an appropriate image. The hook is designed to go into that eye. A fish hook, an open eye. <coughs> You'll crash. The image has just been destroyed. Fish hooks don't belong in human eyes or any eyes for that matter, because you've destroyed the eye. So what's the meaning? You don't fit into me. It's like, go away. And maybe that's the, speak, maybe that's the listener of, to his coy mistress. Go away. Okay? Now go to 692. I just love that poem because it's, you know, utter starkness. And Bradstreet. First American, first major American poet, all right? Um, Puritan, notice her birth and death dates, 1612, 1672. She wasn't born here. I'm directly related, so I, it's one of the reasons I always include her. Uh, she was born in England. She came over on the Mayflower at age eight. Pretty sure she, yeah, she came over on the Mayflower. Um, author to her book. Little little bit of background. She was a poet. She wrote a, a manuscript because she didn't have printing available to her. But she wrote a manuscript of poems. Her brother-in-law took the manuscript, sailed to England, had it printed. So printed book of poetry. It was an instant success. Brought it back to America. The book was titled, she then had it printed, and the book was titled The Tenth Muse. All right? In traditional um, Greek belief, there were nine muses. Nine muses of writing, different kinds of writing. Poetry, history, lyric, etc., epic, etc. Nine different ones. By calling her the tenth muse, uh, actually, her brother-in-law had the title. Calling her the tenth muse, she's saying, she's a goddess of poetry. Okay? The book is brought back to the United States, and she's like, I don't re remember his name. She's like, John, you really shouldn't have done that. Because it wasn't, the poems weren't finished. Let me put it that way. They were finished in how she had them written in the book, but her impression the implication she gives in this poem is, if I'd known you were going to publish these, I'd have cleaned them up a bit. I'd have fixed some lines, I'd have made some better metaphors, etc. Okay? So this book is an extend, excuse me, this poem is an extended metaphor. The whole poem is a metaphor for her poetry in this book of poetry. The author to her book. This gets prefaced to the second publication of this book of poems that she is responsible for in the United States. So it's, you know, anybody who picks up the book reads this first. And it's kind of her, forgive me for these not being as good as it could be. 
Thou ill-formed offspring of my feeble brain, who after birth didst by my side remain. Okay, so after you were born, I kept you by my side. Well, that's, you know, that's what you want to do with a baby. <clears throat> Till snatched from thence by friends less wise than true, who thee abroad exposed to public view. Notice, she says, the friend was what? True, meaning thought was acting in my best interest, was being loyal to me, but wasn't very wise. Probably because did it without her permission. Okay? So, the ill-formed offspring of my feeble brain, ill-formed, deformed, feeble brain, weak brain, she said was what? This offspring was snatched, stolen, kidnapped, and done what? Exposed to public view, okay? Abroad, in England, not in the United States, or in America. Made thee in rags, halting to the press to trudge, where errors were not lessened, all may judge. And that's probably referring to the kind of paper it was first printed on cotton, not wood pulp. Paper used to be made out of linen and cotton, not wood. Okay. Made the end rags halting to the press to trudge where errors were not lessened, all may judge. The old history of printing, you know, when the person had the uppercase and the lowercase and they had a manuscript in front of them and they're setting the type, it was often the case that because the handwriting in the manuscript might be illegible, there might be words crossed through and things written in, it wasn't always perfectly able to be read clearly. And so sometimes the person setting the press, called the compositor, would read something and go, I don't know what that means, and take a guess, <laughs> and put in a word that may not be the word that's intended. Like in Hamlet's sullied and solid. Okay, that's an example possibly of that. So sometimes in the printing process, errors get into the text. That's the whole reason for what's the branch of um, the practice of English called textual criticism. Not even English, all languages. You have textual critics who try to determine what is the either best version of the text or what did the author actually intend to write and such. So, she says, errors crept in. At thy return, that is when I saw you, now published in print, at thy return my blushing was not small. Why would she blush? Ashamed. My rambling brat in print should mother call. What's the rambling brat? The tenth muse. It's the book. Why does it call her mother? By Anne Bradstreet. It, it names me. Okay. I cast thee by as one unfit for light. Thy visage was so irksome in my sight. That is, she took the book and was like, ew, and shoved it in a drawer. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Yet being mine own, at length affection would thy blemishes amend, if so I could. How do you amend blemishes on a brat? Not by spanking, by the way. That's at least not this kind of brat. Blemishes here means like marks on the face or dirt on the face. What do you do? You take the child, you get a washcloth, and you clean the face off. How do you do that with something you've written? Any of you ever, I had this all the time growing up in school. You're taking a test, you make an error, you erase it, and then you realize you did the same freaking error, and you erase it again, and you end up with a hole in the page. Or it's a stupid scantron, and you put a mark in a O, or a circle, and you realize it's wrong, and you erase it, and yet what's the problem with the Scantron? If you don't get it all the way erased, 
it's still going to take that as possibly as the answer. She gets at this image of, I tried to fix the blemishes, and I made more problems. Thy visage was so irksome in my sight, yet being mine own, at length affection would thy blemishes amend us so I could. I washed thy face, erased things, okay? But more defects I saw, and rubbing off a spot still made a flaw. Now that could be literally in referring to the old, old, before print. Days, if you're writing in a manuscript, which is a calf skin, if you make an error, you don't just erase. What do you have to do with calf skin, vellum? You've got to get a knife and you scrape the ink off the page. Okay? More defects. I, as she tried to correct it, she made more problems. And rubbing off a spot still made a flaw. I stretched thy joints to make thee even feet. Meaning, metrical feet. Stress, unstressed syllable, that's one foot. If you read over that section carefully, that was described in the part on versification and rhyme and meter and rhythm and all that. So she's saying some of the poems had, when they were supposed to have eight syllables, they had seven. So she, I had a student yesterday for um, one of my upper division classes Send me an email. Dr. Sherman, I've got four and a half pages. How much are you going to take off if it's not eight? And I said, you know, it, it depends. I said, you know, you, you can't introduce another quotation to help support your argument and expand on it. And he wrote me back later and said, I had another idea, et cetera. What did he have to do? He had to stretch the feet. He had to get to such and such a length. That's what she's talking about. What else? I stretch thy joints to make the even feet, yet still thou runst more hobbling than is meat. In other words, okay, I'm not a great metricist. I can't get perfect iambic pentameter. Pentameter. Ten rhyming, uh, excuse me, ten syllables. Five feet, accented, unaccented, etc. In better dress to trim thee was my mind. Better dress to make you look more presentable to the public. But not save homespun cloth in the house I find. What? Well, she's talking about, again, the book as a child, her poems as children. She's saying, I can't dress my children in anything but homespun cloth. Why? Think early 17th century or mid 17th century America. You don't go down to Target or Walmart, etc., to buy clothing. You make your own. She has a spinning wheel probably in the corner. She spins her own thread, weaves her own cloth. That's homespun. Okay? What's the image? My poems are about what? Things involved in her daily life. The kitchen, the children, her husband, her house. And guess what? That is what Anne Bradstreet's poems are all about. They're not about kings and queens. They're not about heroes. They're about her children, when her house burned down, the death of children, her husband, things going on in their little town, that's all that they're about. In this array, that is the homespun cloth, the everyday ordinary details of life. In this array amongst vulgars, mayst thou roam. Vulgars, common people, everyday ordinary people. She's not writing for whom? She's not writing for the intelligentsia. She's not writing for English professors who are among the snobbiest people in the world. She's writing for the people down at the local hardware store or the people at the tavern. Weren't many taverns in Puritan England, uh, New England, but you get the idea. 
In critics' hands, beware thou dost not come. That is, stay away from the departments of English. Why? Because they'll rip you apart for not being precise, for not being perfect. And take thy way where yet thou art not known. Meaning, go away from here where everybody knows me. Why? Hey, Anne, read your poem. Not very good. That's why. Let them read it somewhere else where they can't see me, talk to me, hear me. And if for thy father asked, say thou hadst none. Why? What she mean by father here? The inspiration, the thing breathed into. And for thy mother, she's poor. Which caused her thus to send thee out of door. So why did she allow the second printing? She needed money. I don't know. I've never actually checked. I should. Um, if this poem was written after the death of her husband, this preface, I almost bet you it was. And she needs income to support the family. Okay. Notice it's published in 1678, six years after she died. Okay. Uh, 851. We can try. We'll start. A valediction for bidding morning. We won't finish it. This is by John Dunn. We'll barely start it. Um, John Dunn, early 17th century, late 16th, early 17th century poet. Um, I used to work on an edition called the Very Orm Edition of the Poetry of John Dunn, big massive thing, um, of Dunn's poetry. And when I did, one of my jobs was to go through microfilms of late 16th, early 17th century manuscripts and try to find copies of his poems and then copy those so that we could run them through the computer software and stuff. Interestingly, Dunn is the most frequently copied poet of the 17th century. He wrote a little over 200 poems in his lifetime, over 5,000 copies, handwritten copies of those survived. Way, 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 way more than Shakespeare, as an example. And yet, by the end of Dunn's century, end of the 17th century, Dunn was not read for his poetry. He was read for his sermons, because he became the priest, the archpriest, the head priest, the dean, what's called the dean, of St. Paul's Cathedral in London. And he would deliver these sermons that could take up to five hours long. Delivered. I mean, he would stand in the pulpit. And he was such a great sermonizer, people would pack St. Paul's to listen to these. I mean, they were like intellectual fireworks. They'd be sitting there going, okay, now what image is he going to use? Because he just stringed together these images. And almost all of his sermons survived. Well over 100. Okay. He doesn't become known, he doesn't become praised for his poetry again until the early 20th century when T.S. Eliot revives interest in Dunn. He writes a little essay on the metaphysical poets. Dunn is the father of what's called metaphysical poetry and what's called the metaphysical conceit. And what's meant by that, a conceit is an idea or image. Metaphysical, being, the, the practice of being and such like that. A later poet described Dunn's poetry as the violent yoking together of two dissimilar things. Okay? Pope Francis, Hugh Hefner. Dissimilar, right? head of the Catholic Church, etc., founder of Playboy, Playboy Bunnies, hedonism, etc. What do they have in common? They're both men. That's it. It's about the only way you can compare the two of them. Okay? But Dunn does even wilder things. In this poem, for example, 
He compares love. I'll bring one in on Friday. I'll make a note to remember that. He compares love to a compass. Not the kind of compass that tells you north, south, east, west. The kind of compass you use in geometry to inscribe an arc or a circle. What? How do you do that? Okay. Um, it's 8.54. We won't actually even start it. So for Friday, we'll start with a valediction for bidding morning and get as far in the next group of poems as we can. Uh, don't forget the drama quiz is due Monday or Sunday night, I believe, or Saturday night. Saturday night, I'm getting my other classes mixed up with this. If you haven't taken it, take your time. Um, I'll probably put a, when will I do that? I'll put a quiz up over the background stuff for poetry and probably the first couple days of poetry, but I won't do that. I won't have that due till Monday, probably. I'll let you know. 